Okay, hi guys, and welcome to today's show. Today, an absolute chock-a-block show for you. Uh, in a moment, we're going to take a look at the Brightling Super Ocean, uh, the heritage which my patrons voted for. And I know it took a little bit of time, but I get there in the end. I always, always get there in the end. Uh, so I'm very pleased to review that. Also coming up, the uh, a review of my Speedmaster Reduce, the the Shumi, the Michael Schumacher Special Edition, uh, which I'm absolutely enamoured with. Uh, it's a gorgeous little uh, Speedmaster with a with a bit of extra flair. Um, so, of course, before we get into it, I have to do my wristwatch check. And yes, I'm wearing my little Tudor Day date. I still haven't fixed it. I'm probably going to be sending off to Saltzman's, uh, who supplied the Breitling. Uh, thank you guys, by the way. Uh, because they have done fantastic work for me in the past uh, fixing watches and I trust them and that's what it's all about and guys if you need your watches to be repaired or anything like that I do recommend Saltzman's if you're in the United States obviously North America um, so wristwatch check done a little bit of gold for my Monday morning just to just to get me started uh, on my Monday right, you know, a little, something a little bit, you know, <laughs> a little bit of gold. Why not? Why not? Anyway, so wristwatch check done. Let's change perspectives and have a closer look at that gorgeous and a very classy brightening. <laughs> We are finally reviewing the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage in steel. This is the uh, black dial and bezel version. This is the smaller, uh, more conservatively sized, based on their classic uh, 1004 reference, which was first released in 1957. Now, we've got to remember, in the 1950s, that era, so many icons were born, the staples of, of all the big brands. You know, we think of the Omega Seamaster, we think of, of course, the biggest icon probably of them all, the Rolex Submariner, Blank Pan 50 Fathoms, and all the rest of them. And that's something, actually, uh, we should mention. And as we see from the beautiful li little leather case, the logo of their company, and probably my favorite uh, logo of any watch brand, those wings suggest, and there's an anchor there as well. We, we kind of forget their nautical themed watches to a certain extent. When we think Breitling, we think big aviation pieces. We think macho, masculine, loud, large watches with a ton of presence. Well, the Super Ocean Heritage is probably the most understated and classically styled watch uh, of them all, really. It may not be simple in comparison to a, to a, a Max Bill Bauhaus uh, watch, but for Breitling, it is really understated. And it kind of has an elegance, a sexiness about it, which I really, really like. And... A, a lot of people do as well. It's become hugely successful. Now, before I get into this review, I've got to point out there is still, uh, I'm not sure if you can see that, but there is still plastic on it. The stickers are still on it. This is absolutely brand new. I was very, very fortunate enough to manage to um, borrow one of these off uh, Saltzman's that kindly lent this in for review. And by the way, Saltzman's are now, uh, and congratulations to them. I've got to give a big thank you to them. Uh, for making this possible. They are now official Breitling uh, authorized dealers. Uh, and you guys know I, I, I love Saltzman's. They've uh, repaired watches for me. I've bought uh, glycines off them. So I have a very good relationship with them and, and my patrons voted for the Super Ocean. They'd love to see one. So they sent this one along. Of course, I'm not gonna wear it out and about. I'm, I'm even scared to remove the plastic. Now, as I was saying, it's based very, very much on the 1004 and immediately you'll see the styling cues. But what's great is the Breitling uh, in 2007, they uh, released the heritage, the Super Ocean heritage. They took 
all the best styling cues off uh, their iconic 50s diver and kind of modernized it. They gave applied indices there. They stuck with the minimalist uh, bezel like the original. And I, 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 you'll see from the pictures of the original. We've got modern materials, far superior movement. What I love is that they do offer it in these two sizes. So th that's the thing about a Breitling. Uh, uh, many of their watches are often too big for, uh, you know, I love Breitling. I'm a, a huge Breitling fan, but all of the watches I really like are far too big for me. And actually talking of size, let's quickly get the dimensions out of the way. So I must state for Saltzman not to panic, I have got sellotape on the calipers, about 41 and a half, a slight overhang there. We've got a thickness, now this is one of the best things about this watch, of only 13 millimeters. We got a lug width of 22 millimeters, and then lug to lug, we're looking at 51 millimeters. So a really, really nice size, especially if you're like me and you've got smaller wrists. But the retro styling is continued. We, we have no crown guards. We've got this kind of onion style uh, screw down crown, a real throwback to the, to the original. And of course this coin edge bezel. We haven't got any mar uh, numerals on the, uh, the aluminum insert there. We do have superluminova. These small pips on the outer part of the dial. We do have a nice generous application in that arrow hand and the um, baton uh, minute hand there. Beautiful little lance uh, second hand. Actually, while we're talking about the loom, let's quickly have a look at the loom shot. As you can see, the loom is very responsive. Despite the small uh, little loom pips on the dial, they do shine nice and bright. We've got a lovely, beautiful green color to them. The hour hand is simply stunning. That triangle, so easy to read. Uh, and the minute hand is also very solid, that baton minute hand. Uh, it would have been nice to have some loom on the second hand so you could time seconds in the dark as well. Unfortunately there isn't and there is no loom on the bezel either. Also it's a bit tricky to figure out where the 12 o'clock is. You can kind of tell by the gaps but there's no differentiation where 12 o'clock is. I mean if we turn the camera do you, I mean, if I turn it upside down we, or even to the side, it is a little bit kind of confusing, which defeats the purpose of the loom. However, uh, if you're in kind of low light, you could probably figure it out. Let's take it back to the studio. So those hands are very, very uh, true to the original, as, as is uh, the crown and the bezel and all the rest of it. The case is all high polished. Uh, we don't have any brushed surfaces, uh, not even on the back. We have that typical um, scalloped edged screw down case back. It weighs about 168 grams, which is on the heavier side, but because of its slender profile uh, and its extremely comfortable bracelet, it doesn't feel that heavy. Beautiful curved lugs that really curve down and you'll see uh, when I put it on my wrist, you just see how, how it hugs the wrist. And what's great about this watch is that it's, it's thin. We have a, a thin flat sapphire crystal and actually because of its minimal styling it's it's very understated this the, the matted bezel really helps that it wears perfectly for both formal and casual it's it's very much a a watch that if you only had to have one watch this really would suit all occasions uh, and the great thing is it is at the end of the day it is still a sports watch uh, with that 200 meter water resistance the same funnily enough as the original 1957 we got a date there at three o'clock and these beautiful diamond polished applied markers S slight differentiation between the 12 o'clock we've got, got a double there at 12 slightly tapering uh, the one at to the nine and six very subtle details but this is what this watch is all about it's subtle variation in details which is something you know you don't expect to say about a Breitling everyone goes straight away to the Seamasters from Omega or the or the Rolex um, you know Submariner obviously or the or the Sea Dweller or whatever we, we tend to overlook Breitling when it comes to dive watches and that's also mainly due to the them being more famous with the aviation watches, especially as their advertising is always, you know, with, with jet planes. And almost a decade later is the fact that it's aged so well. It's still a very handsome uh, watch. And I think that's got to do with its classic styling. And I've said this many, many times, when a watch is classically styled, 
a little bit more understated and a little bit more elegant, they tend to age very, very well. So we have a 120 click unidirectional bezel, very, very solid and everything you'd, you'd expect. My only criticism of the bezel is it is at the end of the day, an aluminium insert. I would have liked to see, especially at this price range, a ceramic. Now it is matted, but you can easily get a matted ceramic bezel. One of the things I absolutely adore about this watch is undoubtedly its uh, mesh bracelet. Breitling refer to this bracelet as the Ocean Classic, but pretty much it's a Milanese. Uh, it's got a fantastic high polish, the construction of it, its movement, uh, even the links, if we see there, you can see that they are screwed in. Uh, it's not held by, together by pins. No expense has been spared. It's very substantial, yet it has a fluidity. You can get a really good fit. I love the fact it tapers, which is something you don't see that often on a mesh bracelet. I think really helps uh, to cut down on bulk gets a more kind of elegant look to the watch. Breitling always have a very wide lug uh, width. Even on my 41 millimeter Navi timer, it's, I think it's about 22. Um, but actually the taper helps it look a little less bulky. The quality, the machining, the finish on every component is always top notch with Breitling. That's something I've always, always noticed about them. The clasp itself is exquisitely made, beautiful high polish with of course the Breitling logo uh, signed there. And as you open it, there, do bear in mind there are stickers here, but it is a beautiful high polished as well. Little incremental adjustments there to get a precise fit. Even with the links, I mean, look at the size of these links. These are very small. You can get a really good comfortable fit with this. And what's beautiful about the mesh, especially on a nautical watch like this, breathable, it's perfect for hotter climates, going to the beach. It really is the, the ultimate steel bracelet in my opinion. May, well, maybe the, the Oyster just nips ahead, but it is one of the most comfortable bracelets, especially because, I mean, just look, look, at, look at its fluidity when it moves, it's just outstanding. Uh, and, and there's no, you can't even see through it. It's so solidly built. It's one of the best mesh bracelets I've ever seen, definitely. When Breitling do bracelets, they do them really, really well. So let's talk a little bit about the movement. Well, inside we have the Calibre 17, which is basically an ETA or an ETA 2824-2 automatic movement. It has the quick set uh, date complication there. Uh, I'll just unscrew the screw down crown and you will see when it pops out, Oh, and threads beautifully, by the way. Pull it out all the way. No wobble, it's so solid. It's hackable, obviously we've got manual wind as well. It is undoubtedly one of the most robust ETA movements out there. Um, it truly is an absolute tank. Relatively affordable to uh, re repair. Now, the Calibre 17 is the high-grade ETA. And what's fantastic is it's also COSC certified. Now it has been tuned and assembled by Breitling at Le Champ de Fonds in Switzerland. You know, there's a little bit of decoration, but at the end of the day, this is still a tool watch. This is a sports watch, a tool watch. I couldn't think of a better movement. It's certainly going to be more robust and reliable than any in-house uh, movement that uh, Breitling offer. So it operates at 28,800 vibrations an hour. As I screw down the crown, you can see that beautiful smooth sweep. It's a 25 joule movement. We have a, a 42 hour power reserve. And in terms of accuracy, well, we're looking at, uh, according to Breitling's uh, COSC certification, it has to be between minus four to plus six seconds in a 24 hour period. It has a beautifully matted finish to the actual dial. The crisp lettering is done extremely well. We've got a very simple minute track running around the outside. Little numerals just for 15, 30, 45, and 60. Almost, you almost don't notice it. And I do like that italicized Super Ocean. I think it kind of, uh, it's in fitting with its retro uh, theme aesthetic of the watch. And then of course, Swiss made at the bottom. So let's have a quick wrist shot. As you can see on my smaller wrist, 
it wears very, very well. And what I love about the Super Ocean Heritage is because of the curvature of those lugs and the way they point downwards, it really hugs the wrist fantastically. Let's summarize the watch. Well, let's talk about its negatives first. I do think that maybe there is a little bit of clutter with the, the lettering on the dial. Uh, it could have been even more minimally done. I'm not sure what you, you could take away. Also, I think a negative is the lack of ceramic uh, bezel. I think now in this era, it would have been nice to update it with the ceramic bezel. Still keep it matted, um, you know, to keep its elegance. When you consider you can get a ceramic bezeled Oris Aquas for around thousand dollars, I think it would have been nice to see it on this Breitling. It costs, you know, four or five times as much. And the, the loom is not that uh, amazing on the actual dial itself, although the hands are nicely done. Professional divers are kind of going to scoff at it. They're not really going to consider it a true diving watch. However, it is still very legible uh, in general, uh, but I think the, uh, the loom is, is not going to impress the professional divers. My only last criticism is the clasp. Although it is beautifully done, uh, I would like to see maybe a push button deployant. It feels a little bit dated. Very, very minor negatives. The positives of this watch far outweigh any negatives. It's a beautifully modern, updated version of a classic Breitling with a, a heritage uh, and a pedigree you can be proud of. It's a mix of tool sportiness and at the same time a strange kind of dressy elegance especially on the mesh the mesh always makes something look a little bit dressy i mean you can wear this with a suit with casually on the beach very few watches can boast that and i think its thinness also uh, would suit going under the cuff uh, very nicely indeed performance is outstanding it's uh cost certified chrono certified so you can't really knock it there at all some people might have an issue it being an ETA uh, essentially in there, but you know, this is the, the top grade version and it is cost certified. So, and actually, personally, in my opinion, 2824 is a proven, proven, extremely reliable. I mean, that thing is hard as nails. Um, I don't think I'd actually prefer it to the in-house. I really would. And certainly the uh, repair bill, the servicing is going to be less uh, when it comes time for it. You know, it's been almost a decade since its release and it still looks just as timeless, just as classic. Uh, I think it's going to look great in 20 years time. It's just ravishing. The way it plays with the light, beautiful. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. I'm hugely impressed by this. Uh, n by no means perfect, but definitely, definitely one of the classiest Breitlings you can get out there. Let's take it back to the studio. Okay, welcome back guys. So, what did you make of the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage? Please let me know your thoughts, queries, questions, opinions, all the rest of it down below. I love hearing your feedback. Uh, so now, let's change again to something a bit different. An iconic chronograph, but with some extra flair. It is, of course, my little Speedmaster, so let's change perspectives and have a closer look. Today, I'm finally reviewing my beautiful little Speedmaster Reduced from Omega, Michael Schumacher Limited Edition. The reference number is 35185000. Now, you guys know, uh, well, if you're new to the channel, then you won't, but uh, I'm a big Speedmaster fan. Uh, previously to this one, I had the first Omega in space. I had several uh, Speedmaster reduced before that, and even before that, I had the original Man on the Moon, uh, which is, of course, uh, the most iconic watch of all time, as voted by my Facebook group. This is my latest Speedmaster, and I'm I'm very very happy to be back in the reduced territory. Uh, I bought the first Omega in space. I had that for over a year, and I really loved that piece. But something called me back to the reduced, and I decided to go for this one basically for because of this slight pop of color and the difference in the dial now before we, we i get into all the nitty gritty of my decision making and what i love about this timepiece let's just get the basic specifications out of the way if uh, perhaps you're new to this 
uh, channel or, or new to the Speedmaster Reduced. Essentially, it has the Caliber Omega 3220 movement inside, which is basically an ETA 2892-A2 uh, with a Dubuis de Poix module in it. That's the 2020 module. Uh, it operates at 28,800 uh, beats an hour, 46 joule movement, which is quite a staggering amount. It's almost as if they just bunged a whole lot of j extra joules in there. I, I don't know why it had, has such a, a high joule count, but anyway. Uh, also, uh, it has a 40 hour power reserve, and obviously, the the Puy de Poix module is the chronograph module. Now the uh, reduced the Amiga reduced has been out for absolutely decades. Uh, however, in about 2006, you know, they put sapphire glass in it. They uh, improved the water resistance and gave it a new class. This one is essentially exactly the same as the original uh, Speedmaster reduced. The only difference is. Uh, the dial and of course the signed case back uh, with the beautiful Schumacher signature there. Uh, actually, let's just have a closer look and you can see it's uh, limited to 6,000 pieces. This is number 4741. It's to commemorate Michael Schumacher winning a Formula One championship in 2000 and actually I was there. Now I can't remember if I was at the Spa circuit in Belgium or at the Hungary uh, because I went several years in a row my father was an ardent uh, Ferrari uh, fan being Italian of course and uh, I got to see Schumacher I mean every time I, I, I went to a Formula One he, he was winning it was though the years of his great rivalry with uh, Mika Hakkinen in the McLaren was it the McLaren no 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 it was a Mercedes I, I can't I can't remember but Anyway, and it was fantastic because this is a year that I was actually there. I really must uh, find my old ticket. Uh, uh, the, I've kept the ticket somewhere there in my house in England. I'll have a look. So Ferrari won the Constructors' Championship and Shumi won the uh, Championship, uh, the Drivers' Championship. So um, really, really cool bit of history and, and being there and definitely adds to this watch being a little bit more special. So let's quickly get the dimensions out the way uh, if you're not familiar with the reduced and the reduced like the name suggests is a more moderately sized version of its bigger famous uh, manual wind uh, brother so to speak so 38 millimeters in diameter got a thickness is quite thick uh, mainly due to that um, domed Hesselite 12 millimeters. Actually, it's not that thick. Uh, lug to lug, we're looking at 45 millimeters, and then lug width, if I remember correctly, it's 18. So there you go. So a really nice compact size, very unlike the its bigger brother. Actually, this is more wears more like a date just than the Man on the Moon. And for me, that's perfect because you you, you guys know I have uh, minute wrists. So for me, absolutely perfect. I just love it. I'm going to be wearing this one pretty much on the bracelet, uh, although it looks great on all kinds of leather straps. The Speedmaster, one thing they all have in common is they're extremely versatile watches. So the crystal is, this is not the, uh, not like the 2006 version. This is the plexiglass and you can kind of tell like, the way it distorts that beautiful plexi vision, I guess you could call it. The way um, you know sapphire glass just just doesn't do that in the same way. It is easy to scratch, but at the same time with um, Hesselite you can just buff it out and it looks great. We have that iconic tetrametric scale running around the inside in that little insert there. The compacts um, setup of the uh, we have seconds of the main, main clock here. We have hours. I think it's 12 hours there for the chronograph and then 30 minute counter for the um, chronograph as well. Beautiful minutes and seconds track running around. That's very like the uh, Tintin, but the red obviously being a kind of nod to the Ferrari. The case obviously is stainless steel and we have beautiful brush sides contrasted with the high polish. These curved lugs, bit like a tail wings of a Cadillac. And then the bracelet. The bracelet is the old school bracelet, so it's just held in by resistance it's not hasn't gotten the uh pushes that the the newer 2006 uh reduced has which i must say that the 2006 reduced if you can find one they are absolutely amazing they have all the upgrades they really do a much better bracelet much better um 
class. Now this is a good telltale sign that the Speedmaster hasn't been overly polished. You still see the ink in the black ink in the Speedmaster. In many they're just polished out. That's the same for the case back. All the lettering is there. The, the ink is still deposited in the uh, engraving. So we have that beautiful pushers that are just so iconic of uh, the Speedmaster there. Now this is how you can tell that it's got the Dupuis de Poix module is that the crown sits slightly lower than the pushers. Um, so that's a telltale sign. And look at that, that pla it's almost like it sits on a platform like a UFO, the, uh, the glass. I really love that. Some people are not into it, but yeah, very 60s styling. Um, gorgeous and really harkens back to the to the uh, original Speedmasters. The dial, you know that that jet black. Uh, actually, this one, if we angle it slightly, you can see there's a pattern there, with a checkered pattern. Um, sorry, there's a few little scratches there. You can maybe you can just see it. Maybe let's try angling it that way. In the center, you could just see it. Very very subtle. But there's a checkered pattern, like a like a racing flag. It's a beautiful little uh, feature. And then, of course, those recessed, very subtly recessed subdials, very subtly done indeed. And you know the high contrast between the crisp white lettering and and th those baton hands, just so Speedmaster. It's so Speedmaster, isn't it? <laughs> So it's got a water resistance of 30 meters, which is uh, not very much at all, but it's sufficient for a racing watch. We have got manual wind and something unlike the 1861 movement I had in the um, first Omega space, when you pull out the crown, it is hackable, uh, which is a cool touch because it wasn't in the, um, the, the Le Mani based manual wind movement I had before. And also I've got to say the manual wind the feeling you get when you wind this is very satisfying. Uh, it's got a really nice feel to it, and I think that's ma mainly down to the uh, the 2892. It's just a great, solid, very, very reliable uh, ETA movement. Being from 2000, obviously, because it's uh, to commemorate that uh, Formula One, uh, the loom still works. So let's quickly have a look at the loom shot right now. Now, as you can see, even from a watch over a decade uh, old, the loom is really responsive and very bright considering how thin the application is. The other great thing is the double marker at 12 uh, makes it easy to read the time in low light and uh, from any angle. So you always know where the 12 o'clock position is. My only slight criticism, I wish the uh, second hand was illuminated but then again it is on the subdial uh, but look great loom for a watch from the year 2000 anyway uh, let's take it back to the studio just look at that dome just gorgeous i, I can't stop looking at a domed uh, crystal now the condition of it, it it has got some wear and tear there's a few scuffs on the uh the signed crown there uh you know, you'll see scratches on the bezel, things like that. But to be honest, I don't mind. I really don't mind. I think it will add to its character. And the strange thing is about this watch is I feel that I, I didn't intend to buy it as an investment. I bought it just because I love that pop of color. I think it really gives it an extra, uh, an extra dimension of pizzazz, a little bit of flair, but it's not like overly done because some of the special editions, there's another racing one with the blue dar. It's not as subtle. This looks a little bit like the Tintin, and also because of its limited amount, I think it's really going to go up in value. So although I'm not deliberately looking for investment uh, possibilities or value proposition or whatever they, they call it, the irony is that I, I do think it's going to become very, very sought after, especially as Omega have discontinued the uh, the classic reduced not uh, they've moved it over to ladies watches which is just ridiculous because the reduced fits so many wrists as you'll see on mine it's just perfect and there are so many uh, fans of the reduced it, it's a really great versatile watch it gets a bit of a bad rap there is a snobby attitude from the uh, speedmaster purists but you know, I think they're just, they're, they're really missing out on a great watch. Now, the other thing that uh, is is pretty cool about this movement is when you, compared to the uh, manual wind version, when you, when you hit that stop and start, 
it, there's no sudden jolt it gets going immediately, uh, which is really, really nice. And I'll just reset it there. Really nice uh, twist on a classic chronograph. It kills a few birds with one stone, so to speak. I, I wanted something with a little bit of red, but not too much. It's really fun, fits me perfectly. I gotta say the bracelet, it's the old uh, held together by pins. It's nothing spectacular, but it doesn't pull on any hairs. Got a nice kind of silky feel to it. It's a little bit about like a president. Uh, if you see, it's got polished center links and uh, brushed on the outside. It's actually five parts. There's, there's another two little mid links between that polished part. It's very, very comfortable. Uh, despite being a bit dated now by today's standard. The clasp is also, you know, it's, it's, it's a tinny, one of these stamped clasps from the 90s, really. Completely outdated, but, you know, who cares? It's really comfortable and does the job. We do have micro adjustments, which is great. So, yeah, an all-round fun watch. I'm very, very happy, and I think, guys, if you're on the fence about getting reduced, get a reduced because they're not making any more of them. The ones they are making now are just for, for the ladies and, you know, with diamonds and all kinds of ridiculous, um, quite patronizing colors that they, they think uh, women are going to like, which is just ridiculous. My wife would quite happily wear this. <laughs> yeah, it's just ridiculous what, what marketing does. But anyway, that's a whole nother video. Very, very content with this. I think the reduced is what I always wanted, but in a kind of roundabout way, by getting rid of the, my previous reduce, going to the first Omega in space, then coming back and then discovering this little gem, which I got from Japan, by the way, uh, which is always a gold mine for uh, Speedmaster Reduce. The Japanese Prime Minister's famously wore one as well. So, and he had the 2006 version with the Sapphire. Uh, and the upgrades as well. So that's kind of interesting. Accuracy wise, I'm getting a really good, uh, you know, plus seven, eight seconds a day. It's remarkably accurate. Anyway, guys, um, that's my review of this particular Speedmaster Reduced. I'm gonna leave it there. Let's take it back to the studio. Now, one thing I would like to add before we go. Now, uh, I did kind of leave it out of the review, but uh, well, I've left a ton of things out, out of the review, but this is important. The Speedmaster only weighs 100 grams, you know, compared to the Super Ocean uh, Heritage that's 168 grams, and it's really not that much bigger. It just goes to show how comfortable and how light the Speedmaster is, as the Reduce that is. Uh, it weighs exactly the same as the standard version. So I just thought I'd add that. I am absolutely uh, besotted with that watch. I'm very, very happy. Um, so, let me know your thoughts, queries, questions, opinions, all the rest of it, as usual, down in the comments below. I love hearing your feedback. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave it there before I start rabbiting on and rambling uh, and uh, for donkeys. So, thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one.